So are, are we are we quite excited by the um, roadmap out of lockdown that was uh, announced yesterday? Well, Scott, I, I always like to think that I'm a positive, enthusiastic person, always looking for the half glass full guy rather than half glass empty. But my glass is full tonight. Today, I can tell you I'm very excited uh, about what the government have done. I think it makes a lot of sense. I know they're looking at data, but this is the best news I've had as somebody who lives and loves live events. This is the best news I've had in a very, very long time. So really looking forward to it. Obviously, this is impacting Lancashire on and off the pitch. Um, we'll get to matters pretend, you know, off the pitch in a minute. In terms of uh, issues on the pitch, the, the, the prospect of having people inside sports stadiums by kind of mid-May is, is terrific news, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. I think you know, a lot of us don't understand the impact of mental health on, on our staff. We've had a lot of staff that have been on furlough for the best part of a year or flexi-furlough. We've had members who and fans and uh, who are desperate to actually watch some cricket who just who kept having it taken away from them last year they kept having this kind of yes you can do a bit yes we think we can do this yes we think you can come in august or late september and then it just got the rug got pulled right at the last minute and the trials got pulled and i think and i think there's some people who are just desperate to get out and watch cricket there are people who are desperate to to just experience live events actually to go and do something um and uh, and, you know, people talk about the roaring 20s after the First World War. And I genuinely believe we're going to have the same again. I think, you know, there's something like £250 billion pounds of savings in households that people haven't, which is, a, is an eye-watering number, uh, where, because people just haven't been spending any money because they've been on, on lockdown. And we've got to find a way as the events and sports industry to to give them a way that they can spend some money and get out and watch live events and watch live sport. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. And it's sure you know, mental health is really important. And, and when you get a, somebody saying, all oh, right, yes. Um, you know, forget booking a summer holiday this year, that stuff matters. And actually you'd be better not saying anything because people then get down and worry about, Oh, you know, I can't be facing this again for another six months. Whereas actually to be able to say that, you know, we're going to get uh, people watching cricket. We safely showed last year that we can get people playing cricket, which was, if you like, our K2 to climb. Now we've got our Everest. And as a game, speaking to to others, so a number of other CEOs, we're really up for this challenge and we want to find a way of, of doing this as safely and as quickly as we can. The fixture schedule obviously is now fully released. Um there was a suggestion that perhaps it might be adapted depending on what government restrictions will be lifted in order to get fans in, especially for the T20 blast, perhaps push that later in the summer. Would you would you expect it to be as it is because the, the prospect of fans returning by mid-May now? Oh, without doubt. I think I think there was probably only a few that were looking at that. I think you know, the vast majority of us absolutely believed that we're in a very different place this year than where we were last year. Where we were last year, there genuinely was very little certainty of anything, and it kept moving on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, the, you know, the goalposts kept kept getting moved, so nobody really knew what the outcome was going to be. Um, and actually, getting behind closed doors cricket away was a big enough challenge in that environment. This year, we've got a very, very different background. We've got an incredibly successful vaccination program, which is already demonstrating reductions not only in in hospitalizations and mortalities but in transmission and i think that's the key point is if it can actually reduce transmission which is the current data shows that it does that's the real game changer which is why you know a few of my colleagues a couple of weeks ago were like oh woe is me and i'm not sure we you know we can be playing any cricket this year and you know perhaps we should just shut up shop i'm like you're a first class cricket club your your whole raison d'etre is to be able to have elite cricketers play cricket and actually we have an obligation to do everything we can to make that happen and actually this year this is before the announcement I believe the background is very different and much more positive than last year specifically because of the vaccination program so um, no I think the vast majority of my colleagues would accept that um, we don't need a plan b for a revision of the schedule now is that uh, you know actually that's just going to create more uncertainty why would you know yes we put in the the refund and the rollover program to give people confidence, you know, unlike if, if you book some 
air tickets at the moment. You can't get a refund, but you might be able to get a voucher if you're lucky. But you, but actually, voucher is difficult. More often, you've got to choose exactly when you're going to rebook your flight for, which is very challenging. Whereas I think what we've done as a game is said, no, you can you can get a full refund or you can get a rollover. So we've given people confidence to go and book. But why would you book a ticket if the message out there is, well, we're not quite sure. And in a few weeks time, we might just revert and change the whole fixture schedule around. And I think last year I, I kind of understood that. But this year, I think the environment is much, much more positive. So you're, so actually, able now, you're actually able now to go out and market and try and sell tickets for the T20 Blast? Yes. And we're going for that alpha leather it's something that's that's really important to us we want to get fans back in stadium watching t20 blast and we recognize that that'll be a bit of a stagger you know but that's probably right in terms of what we need to do safely you know with some social distancing to start getting back you can't just go from north to 60 on stuff for this i remember just with behind closed doors last year it was an it was an epic piece of work and, you know, you can't just go straight back into full crowds. We're going to have to do this in a, in a safe and managed way. Uh, in terms of issues off the pitch, uh, Daniel, obviously there's some big announcements there potentially about hotels reopening and the ability to, to, to host conferences and, and the like, which obviously is a fundamental part of what Lancashire as a club is all about. So you must be, again, you know, relieved that, 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 that there are dates now in, in place for that to, to reopen. Very much so. I think, you know, the likes of... Um, Surrey, Yorkshire, uh, Edgebaston, ourselves uh, have always had much bigger conference and events businesses than perhaps other counties. And, and so uh, that we've been particularly uh, hard struck last year with the kind of decimation of, of conference and events and uh, business. And, and the whole point with that was last year, it was it, the events industry, which I think is, it, you know, is, it, is, a, is a massive, huge amount of money. I, you know, I think it's, it's, um, it's in the billions. But because there's multiple different elements within the events industry, it's not the same as sports, so it didn't have the same lobbying voice with government. So you might have everything from a wedding organiser organizer to an exhibitor to a conference organiser to somebody who just arranges meeting bookings to concerts and so there's so many different parts of the events industry that actually you know it was really difficult and we didn't get cut through as a, as a game or as an industry to say do you know what hosting 100 or 200 people for a conference you, you take the point that can take a thousand column free we came very close to getting a pilot away last year for 200 people in a room that can take a thousand with three separate entrances three separate routes that were zoned off through our experience on behind closed doors, three separate sets of toilets, three separate exits to demonstrate to government that we could operate 200 people in the point safely. It was going to be a bit of a rigmarole operationally, but we believed absolutely we could do it. The challenge was as a game is we didn't get the cut through to demonstrate that, that actually 500 people in the TK Maxx in a city centre somewhere for non-essential retail or a large pub garden, we, we didn't get across that actually, well, why can't you have 200 people in an indoor meeting as long as the window's open, as long as you've got social distancing, as long as you've got your one-way routes? And exactly the same with smaller crowds for stadia. You know, actually, how is, a sm how is 500 people watching a cricket match outdoors, socially distanced, a higher risk than 500 people in a massive retail store. And I think that's one of the challenges that we still need to work on as a game to say, you know, let's actually, let's actually get the data. Let's do the research. Is the transmission higher for a smaller crowd sitting outdoors in a stadium than it is in a large retail environment or a large pub garden or a large zoo or a theme park? You know, these are the things where it's about consistency and it's about data and it's about risk. We've got work to do. And just a final one for me on it. Um, obviously, the hundreds been launched as well, as well as the domestic competitions in this country. Um, how much of a united front is there amongst your colleagues to make sure that this is this is that this is driven forward and that cricket is restarted and you, you've got people in the ground. I mean, you, you mentioned before, Daniel, that some of your colleagues are a little maybe more lacklustre to, towards the idea. Uh, I think the vast majority of, of in the game 
uh, of other counties uh, absolutely want to get cricket back on. I think there, you know, there are a few that are that are that are more nervous and are more cautious, and I get that. I completely get it. But I think the vast majority of us desperately want to get this back on. I think, as far as I'm concerned, you know, in the same way that we're looking forward to hosting England, we're looking forward to hosting Manchester Originals at Emirates Old Trafford and putting on a fantastic venue experience. And and that's something you know we've got, as you know, an IT20 against Pakistan and our Roses game in July. Uh, which we're selling 100% for, and um, and absolutely, we believe that um, you know the EC, we're encouraging the ECB, who obviously, as, as you're aware, are responsible for the sales for the for the hundred. Uh, we're encouraging them to sell to 100% as well for the for the originals, and you know we'll see where they get to. But I think from a venue perspective, we're we're really looking forward to hosting as many major events as we can. Just talk a few numbers. Um... How how much has COVID cost you as a club? Well, I think there's one big headline number. 2019, we turned over 34 million. Uh, 2020, our turnover, uh, just going through audit, but it's it's not going to be above 16. Now, there's not many people that can cope with an 18 million drop in turnover in one year without pain. So... Uh, we've had significant pain, Chris. It's been very, very challenging year, definitely. I mean, the club has had its challenges before, but as has been reported before, 2020 was extraordinary for us. It was, you know, I think we had, as I previously said, four very, very different financial scenarios back in March last year. We lost our chairman. And ultimately, everybody in the club did a brilliant job to get us through the year. And I think that's that was the description we got through the year. I think now, now we're in a better place. The environment has changed. It's um, it's it's improved, and you know we're just looking particularly confidence, like an economy. Confidence is everything. And what the government did yesterday is they started to provide some certainty and confidence, which means which means people then will start to think about booking tickets for things. You know, our our, our test match against India in September had already been doing well. Um, and actually very, very little availability left now, apart from the Monday. And confidence is really important, and we're in so much a better place now than we were during 2020. So I think, yeah, the, the big headline number is, you know, we, we, uh, we dropped 18 million turnover in the space of 12 months, which is, you know, which is a cliff edge in anybody's book. So, so for May the 17th, hopefully fans in, how many fans can you get into to Old Trafford on, under the government guidance? Um, well... I think Old Trafford, you have to speak to Manchester United, but Emirates Old Trafford, uh, uh, Chris, then uh, I think we're looking at around just over 6,000 because it's 25%. Yeah. But, you know, you can't just do that in one go. I think it's very important to me that any pilots or trials aren't just around the European Championships and that we need pilots and trials in April for the county championship. It's a perfect audience because a lot of them will be have been vaccinated. We also have the space because we've got 17 acres to do a lot of uh, lateral flow volume testing. And I think that's something that's very high on the government's agenda. And we're very keen to support to support that. So as far as I'm concerned, I want to be getting members back into watch county cricket in April. Uh, not in huge numbers, but I think we need to get those pilots away and we need to work with government closely as a game to say you want data let's do some let's do the more pilots the more data last year we had two pilots that i think i remember and then it all got stopped we need loads of pilots we need loads of different environments we need loads of test parameters let's give you that data so that we don't just have a situation where we're, we're rushing in blind on may the 17th i mean and in terms of the if all goes well the t20 black are you selling for twenty six thousand with the temporary stand or what are your plans so far and test match well, I think the capacity is more like, I think, 23 now, I think, but we're, uh, after the hotel was constructed, but we are selling to to 100%. I think um, I think we've got a slightly smaller stand this year, so I think the, the capacity is down to about 21 and a bit, but we are, we, we are very much um, selling as much as we can. I think it's hard for us this year because the blast schedule got um, confirmed so late that we're, we, it's really put us under pressure. You know, I think we've got this huge marketing machine, uh, 100, grand a, 100 grand a match that's coming in for the 100 starting in March the 1st. And, you know, we've got to, we've got to work hard 
alongside that to uh, to make sure that we give it a best go. So I think almost certainly last year we got just under, sorry, not last year, of course, 2019, we broke all records and got to just under 100,000 last attendees. Uh, this year, I think we're targeting 80 odd. And I think that's because we know that there will be a Venn diagram and that there will be current attenders and fans of T20 that, that will want to see the 100. It won't be entirely a new audience. That's, that's just being pragmatic. So we're going for it, but it is a challenge in that we've literally only just been able to get the blast on sale to priority groups and that the blast doesn't technically go on sale till, till next um, Monday, I think it is. And we've got, a, as a game, we've got a lot to do. Do you, do you think there's a fear of um, making people comfortable in going to events again, that they've been in lockdown for so long that you might struggle to sell as many tickets as you want because people are still a bit concerned about the, the virus and the spread of it? I think the great thing about human beings, Chris, and we'll all have experience of this with our families and friends, is that I'm sure you have as well. I, I've got certain friends who are what I would call in the reckless category is that they, they you know, that they're, they're really not bothered. They're like, why can't we just get out? What's the problem? And then I've got other friends who are like, who have been a hermit for a year and haven't left the house. And I think uh, everything being delivered to the door. And I think generally society is like that. I don't think, it, I don't think this is, you know, uh, it, it's that straightforward. I think genuinely there are people who will be desperate just to just to book, just to order, just to do whatever they can. There are others that we're going to have to coax. And, you know, I, I think we saw a bit of that with when we did a lot of research with some of particularly our conference and events customers, the people are nervous. And I think actually what we learned with Behind Closed Doors is if we can give people clear, and I found this with staff coming back in because when I had staff coming back in for Behind Closed Doors, there was quite a few who were like, well, um, I want to come back in, but I'm a bit nervous because I've been on furlough and I'm not quite sure. And what's the infection rates, which is completely understandable. So we, we did a load of communication over communication, if you like, with our staff coming back in at that point to say, this is the plan. Here's images, here's pictures, here's diagrams. This is where you'll come in. This is where you'll do your temperature test. This is where you'll do your health questionnaire in advance. These are the one-way systems. These are the red dots for the, on the doors for the high volume areas for high frequency cleaning. We're putting in multiple cleaning frequencies throughout the day. And, and actually, it felt a bit like over-communication. But in the end, we, the feedback we got was that the staff really appreciated actually seeing and feeling and hearing what we were doing to keep them safe. And customers are no different. So when we were looking to hopefully get away some conference events pilots last year, we were looking at some videos and some images that could actually show rather than just putting it down on a website with words. And we're definitely going to have to do a lot of that to get some customers to feel comfortable to come back. But I believe that with our experience of behind closed doors and launching safe in one place, that we're well placed to do that. It's But what we learned was you just have to over communicate and explain exactly how somebody gets in, where they go, how they can go to the toilet, how they can sit, how they can be socially distanced. And, and give them that confidence to feel safe. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about your members, because um, obviously they've had, uh, you know, a, a year of not being, able to, not being able to go to the stadium. I mean, it's kind of been 18 months, hasn't it? Um, uh, and just in terms of how patient they've been with paying subs and, uh, and what you've kind of done in return, are you seeing that people are, have paid and have not asked for refunds and are, are, are rejoining again this year, despite the fact that, as you mentioned, they're not going to see the first bit of the championship or maybe not see the first bit of the championship? I think uh, it's a great question, Lizzie. I think they've been really tolerant, really patient, really loyal. Uh, I think the vast majority uh, took rollovers, um, effectively, you know, uh, well, actually, sorry, even more than that, sorry, rollovers on tickets. But actually, for, for a lot of members, we put in place a donation scheme. And I was just completely blown away by the love and support by a large percentage of our members who donated their 2020 membership to the club, uh, which was which was fantastic. So we had a number of members who donated. We had a number who effectively chose to just roll it into into 2021's membership. And we also recognised that we had some members who really wanted to support, but financially um, they couldn't they couldn't manage that. So that was fine too. So it was, you know, we gave people full refund if they wanted it. And 
So I think we had a mixture, but generally I was blown away with their loyalty and support and dedication. And I think in terms of renewals, we're kind of okay. We're kind of on track with where we are generally. There's a few people, as you would understand, money-wise, who, who wait just before the season starts, before they renew, which I think is fine. And we're kind of seeing that pattern again. I think it's, it's part of our job to do everything we can as a game and encourage the ECB as well to be as positive as we can to get pilots back in for county championship in April, which I do believe with, with if you look at the demographics, the vast majority of them will have been vaccinated, that actually if you're looking at lower risk, safe things to do, getting members in socially distanced in small numbers into county championship games in April, I believe it's something we all should be doing to reward those members who have been very, very patient. So what's the process really for lobbying to, to get those um, to get those pilot test events in that you were talking about? I mean, is that going to be done centrally sort of through the ECB, through David Marnie and, and, and the lobbying to the ECMS there? Or is that something that you can drive as Lancashire? Well, I believe David's done a great job last year with working with government on a number of these areas. I think uh, David has a difficult job to do because he has to effectively lead on that from a from a game perspective. Um, I think there's uh, four or five CEOs that are now on a working group with ECB specifically to look at accelerating uh, the return of crowds. I'm, I'm one of those CEOs and, and we'll be keen to work in as a small group to come up with a number of creative ideas, working with the likes of Steve Elworthy, who out of everybody in the ECB really understands how venues operate. You know, is the, is, is the, the single person who really understands and gets it and who understands practical solutions. And actually what we need here is, is to be able to feed into to Stig uh, as directly as we can. Um, mm-hmm. Don't worry about this because we've got a practical solution that as a game, as, as bigger venues, we believe that we can come up with a plan to do this safely and crucially to gather the data that you're looking for. So I think to me, the approach is very much about, we'll absolutely support David Marnie in the game central approach, but as a game, as bigger venues with spaces that we should be looking to work, collaborating much closer together than we have in the past, looking at all of our, best practice from us from behind closed doors from edge baston and surrey from doing the pilots last year so effectively what can we all learn what can we all bring and add to the table you know look at look at all of the stuff that steve elworthy has done with the, the whole behind closed doors program and actually come up from an operational perspective is how do we physically do some of this stuff and do it in a safe way and gather data at the same time so coming across in, in a non-confrontational way to say how can we help solve problems rather than just asking difficult questions and, and that's 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 going to be our approach because obviously the county championship starts in five weeks or something is it it's not very long not very long away at all i mean how realistic is it that you can get those conversations and those processes in place prior to the 8th of april i we have we have the keenness and the enthusiasm in <laughs> in the four or five ceos uh, and with steve elworthy i think we just have to be keep being positive Lizzie, I, I believe that this is about practical low risk solutions. And I, I believe if you if we provide rather than just being difficult or complaining, let's actually come up with practical low risk solutions. And if we do that, and it's about creating a groundswell to say it isn't just about lobbying in a traditional political sense to get what we want. This is about um, practical solutions so I'll, I'll give you an example i think one of the things that the game collectively failed last year and i'm not blaming any individual i'm blaming everybody all of us all of all organizations within games something we collectively failed upon was to get the cut through with government around some of the inconsistencies in sectors so you know the whole famous tk max 500 people large beer garden hospitality um how that is lower risk than than outdoor watching sport i've never quite got my head around i do understand completely the large mass crowd attendance piece you know and i know the government quite rightly have been nervous around the liverpool atletico madrid match around Cheltenham festival around that um, rugby international at twickenham all of those things kind of last spring and I get that completely, and we have to be cautious from the, that element. 
But in terms of smaller crowd pilots, we, we have to look at if you've got 500 people going into a store or you've got 500 people in a massive beer garden, how is that different? And I think one of the things we want to work on as a game is to say, particularly the bigger venues with space, is to say, here's a hypothetical, Lizzie, and I don't know whether we can do this, but it's something I would love to be able to do, is say all of my stands are shut, all of my indoor areas are shut, apart from a one-way system on toilets, which I had for BCD and zoning. But say I had a cricket cafe that had chairs and tables and an open-air bar that did some food and some drink and that say no more than 500 people could sit in that cricket cafe and perhaps watch some cricket. Technically it's watching sport. So somebody might say that that's a challenge, but ultimately in terms of risk, I would say, how is that if it's, if it's outdoors and then nobody's got access to outdoor areas and it's in a cricket cafe, chairs and tables, socially distanced outside of households. I believe we can make that work safely. Also with the 17 acres we have on site, I'd say, right, if, if there's 500, let's do it. Let's do lateral flow testing in the car park. Let's do lateral flow testing, 30 minute result. And you're only coming in if you've got a, if you've got a negative result. And coupled with the fact that that particular demographic are most likely to have been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm slowly being logical, peeling back the layers of the onion to say, tell me what's wrong with that. And I think that's the approach that we're going we're gonna to go on. And we hope that we can get into data. I love the fact that it's about data because as soon as somebody uses a word like data and I'm a logic freak, you know, I love more than anything with this stuff to get into a technical conversation. Give me 10 technical reasons why this isn't going to work. And I'm kind of the kind of person that gets activated by somebody telling me that I can't do something. So give me 10 technical reasons why we can't do it and we'll go away and come up with solutions to those 10 technical reasons. When it's not technical, but it's a feeling or a nervousness or a caution, and you can't get an articulation of why something is a problem, that, that all, that's impossible to solve then because you, you, you don't have a specific technical framework with, it, with which to work in to get into problem solving mode. And I think the key thing we want to do, and I was, it was music to my ears to hear the government talk about data, Let's help you get that data. Let's help get, let's make this a technical rather than it becoming a political conversation, which I don't, I don't think will help anybody. So really the aim is, is, is if you can, is to, uh, to kind of reward members, I suppose. Yes. Uh, is, is that whatever you can do in that period before any crowds are in, is that your members get priority. Priority, without doubt, yeah. yes. And we'd probably have to run some form of a ballot or, ballot or, yeah. Yeah, or, or pre-reg. But if, if I can get anybody in safely in April as form as whether it's part of a cricket cafe or whether it's part of a bigger formal pilot, absolutely members will be prioritised. I was just going to pick up on, on his point on the ballots. Just that, so if you, if it, would that crit go carry on through, through the 25% until you sort of got ramped up to 100%, you'd have a ballot of the members just to reward loyalty? Uh, well, I think at the moment uh, we've we only have just over uh, five six thousand members. So actually, uh, six thousand capacity is twenty five percent. So I wouldn't need to do a ballot oh, when great. we get up to, when we get up to past the seventeenth of May. But it would be prioritised to members. So uh, and that's ultimately what we need to do. What, what what I need to look at is probably is is looking at my early June blast games. Is getting some kind of pre reg from the members because obviously the members at the moment can uh, other than roses can previously can just turn up to last games uh, what i'm going to have to do this year is is get some kind of pre-reg for people to pick and choose the blast games they want to go to so i can i can effectively prioritize a members amount in those games and, and then just two other things just to quickly clarify um J july the first do, do, do you anticipate that could be a, your first 100 percent? and just you, you've kind of referred to it previously with the t20 blast um is that is that something marked in your in your diary then July the first that you could have a that that could be your first full crowd? Uh, yes, I'm 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 looking forward to that. I think we need to work. You know, the government needs to see the data beforehand. I think that's the caveat. And I think, but this is where we can't go from naught to sixty. We need to have a gradual build up of pilots. I actually believe that Edgebaston and MCC should be given an opportunity, perhaps 
to do a bigger pilot than 25% for the um, New Zealand test matches in early June. I think that actually that, that will help the game. So I would absolutely encourage and, and, and that and support that. You know, actually we've, we've currently got um, a, uh, a men's T20 on July the 1st. We've, we've actually got a double header with the women's regional on the, um, uh, I believe it's on the, uh, James confirmed, I believe it's on the 9th. And, and what I'm actually hoping is that I wanted to do one on the 1st with the women's regional, but um, um, ECB couldn't make that happen on a Thursday, bizarrely. I think they wanted all the games at a weekend. So I think we're looking to do a, trying to, trying to actually do a Lancashire T20 friendly against another county for, for a women so we can actually have a, a double header on that day. So I know the ECB can't manage it, but I think we're hoping to work with another county to do a, to do a women's double header. So actually we could have a, a gender balanced first day, hopefully with a big crowd. So uh, that's something we're looking to do.